The Pawnee are a Midwestern Native American tribe of the Great Plains historically inhabiting much of present-day Nebraska, Kansas and western Missouri. They are federally recognized as the Pawnee Nation which is now headquartered in central Oklahoma. The tribal nation has four confederated bands, the Chowee, Kitkahaki, Pitaharuet and Skiri. Historically, the Pawnee lived in permanent earth lodge villages while they farmed and left the villages on seasonal buffalo hunts, using teepees while traveling. Their religion was centered on human sacrifice and the annual worshipping of the sun and stars. Among the warrior societies within the tribe, Mohawk hairstyles were common. In the early 19th century, the Pawnee numbered over 10,000 people and were one of the largest and most feared tribes of Plains Indians in the West. They had escaped some of the depredations of exposure to European infectious diseases impacting other Indian tribes. By 1866, disease and warfare had devastated their population to about 1,400. However, by 1874 they were increased up to 2,000. During this time, many warriors offered to serve as trackers and scouts for U.S. Army against hostile Indians as the Pawnee were enemies of many of the other tribes and were therefore willing to aid in military campaigns against them. Still subject to enroachment by the Lakota Sioux, most accepted relocation to a reservation to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. About 4,500 are enrolled and live on the reservation, others work or live elsewhere. Their autonym is Chaiksa Chaiks meaning, men of men. The Pawnee language is a Wichito and dialect of the Cadawan language family, which is still spoken by Native Americans in Texas, Oklahoma to as far as southern South Dakota and is of the related tribes such as the Confederated Pawnee, Caddo, Wichita, Kitsai and Arakara. Government there are approximately 3,200 enrolled Pawnee and mainly all reside in Oklahoma. The tribal headquarters is in Pawnee, Oklahoma and the tribal jurisdictional area is in parts of Noble, Payne, and Pawnee counties. The tribal constitution establishes the government of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. This government consists of the Nasharo Council, the Pawnee Business Council, and the Supreme Court. Enrollment into the tribe requires a minimum one-eighth blood quantum. The Nasharo Council, also known as the Chief's Council, consists of eight members, each serving four-year terms. Each band shall have two representatives on the Nisharo Council selected by the members of the tribal bands, Chowi, Kitkehaki, Pitahorata and Skiddy. The Nisharo Council shall have the right to review all acts of the Pawnee Business Council regarding the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma membership and Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma claims or rights growing out of treaties between the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma and the United States according to provision listed in the Pawnee Nation Constitution. Morgan Little Son, 1st Chief Kitkehaki Band Ralph Haymond, 2nd Chief Kitkehaki Band, 2nd Nasharo Council Chief, Matt Reed, 2nd Chief Chowee Band, Pat Leading Fox, Sr., 1st Chief Skiddy Band, Jimmy Horn, 1st Chief Chowee Band, Nasharo Council, Treasurer, Warren Pratt, Jr., 2nd Chief Skiddy Band, Nasharo Council, 1st Chief, Francis Morris, 1st Chief Peter Haroirata Band, Lester Sun Eagle, 2nd Chief Peter Haroirata Band, Nasharo Council Secretary. The Pawnee Business Council is the supreme governing body of the Pawnee Tribe of Oklahoma, subject to the limitations imposed by the Constitution and applicable federal law. The Pawnee Business Council shall exercise all the inherent statutory, and treaty powers of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma by the enactment of legislation, the transaction of business, and by otherwise speaking or acting on behalf of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma on all matters which the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma is empowered to act, including the authority to hire legal counsel to represent the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. Current Pawnee Business Council, Marshall R. Gover, President, Bruce Pratt, Vice President, 
Mistyem, Nuttall, Treasurer, Famien, Little Son, Secretary, Richard Tilden, Council Seat No. 1, Carla Knife Chief, Council Seat No. 2, Adrian Spotted Horse Chief, Council Seat No. 3, Liana Chapman Tetta, Council Seat No. 4. The new council members were voted in by the people. Elections are held every two years on the first Saturday in May. Economic Development The Pawnee operate two gaming casinos, three smoke shops, two fuel stations, and one truck stop. Their estimated economic impact for 2010 was $10.5 million. Increased revenues from the casinos have helped them provide for education and welfare of their citizens. They issue their own tribal vehicle tags and operate their housing authority. Traditional culture. The Pawnee were divided into two large groupings, the Skiddy living in the north and the south bands. While the Skiddy were the most populous group of Pawnee, the Chowee of the South Bands were generally the politically leading group, although each band was autonomous. As was typical of many Native American tribes, each band saw to its own. In response to pressures from the Spanish, French and Americans, as well as neighboring tribes, the Pawnee began to draw closer together. Bands South Bands Chowee, Chowee, or Zawi. Kithahaki or Kitkahaksky, Pitahoriat or Pitahorarata, Pitahoriat, Pitahorarata, Kawarakish from Lakota Aggression, who joined the Kadokin living south, Skiddy Federation or Skiri by the French and Wolf Pawnee by Americans, northernmost band Tori Kaiku, Kitkahakspekuxju, Tuhitspiat, Tukitskita. Tu Horakasar, Arakarari Kutsu, Arakarariki, Tu Hizaku, Tu Warakaku, Ikopik Sawa, Skizari Kus, Stixkartit, Tu Rawiu, Pahuk Stachu, Skirarara, Panismaha. Villages The Pawnee had a sedentary lifestyle combining village life and seasonal hunting, which had long been established on the plains. Archaeology studies of ancient sites have demonstrated the people lived in this pattern for nearly 700 years, since about 1250 CE. The Pawnee generally settled close to the rivers and placed their lodges on the higher banks. They built earth lodges that by historical times tended to be oval in shape. At earlier stages, they were rectangular. They constructed the frame, made of 10 to 15 posts set some 10 feet apart, which outlined the central room of the lodge. Lodge size varied based on the number of poles placed in the center of the structure. Most lodges had 4, 8 or 12 center poles. A common feature in Pawnee lodges were four painted poles, which represented the four cardinal directions and the four major star gods. A second outer ring of poles outlined the outer circumference of the lodge. Horizontal beams linked the posts together. The frame was covered first with smaller poles, tied with willow withs. The structure was covered with thatch, then earth. A hole left in the center of the covering served as a combined chimney, smoke hole and skylight. The door of each lodge was placed to the east and the rising sun. A long, low passageway, which helped keep out outside weather, led to an entry room that had an interior buffalo skin door on a hinge. It could be closed at night and wedged shut. Opposite the door, on the west side of the central room, a buffalo skull with horns was displayed. This was considered great medicine. Mats were hung on the perimeter of the main room to shield small rooms in the outer ring, which served as sleeping and private spaces. The lodge was semi-subterranean, as the Pawnee recessed the base by digging it approximately three feet below ground level. This insulated the interior from extreme temperatures. Lodges were strong enough to support adults, who routinely sat on them, and the children who played on the top of the structures. As many as 30 to 50 people might live in each lodge, and they were usually of related families. A village could consist of as many as 300 to 500 people and 10 to 15 households. Each lodge was divided in two, and each section had a head who oversaw the daily business. Each section was further subdivided into three duplicate areas, with tasks and responsibilities related to the ages of women and girls. 
As described below, the membership of the lodge was quite flexible. The tribe went on buffalo hunts in summer and winter. Upon their return, the inhabitants of a lodge would often move into another lodge, although they generally remained within the village. Men's lives were more transient than those of women. They had obligations of support for the wife but could always go back to their mother and sisters for a night or two of attention. When young couples married, they lived with the woman's family in a matrilocal pattern. Political structure The Pornia are matrilineal people. Ancestral descent is traced through the mother, and children are considered born into the mother's clan and a part of her people. Traditionally, a young couple moved into the bride's parents' lodge. People work together in collaborative ways, marked by both independence and cooperation, without coercion. Both women and men are active in political life, with independent decision-making responsibilities. Within the lodge, each north-south section had areas marked by activities of the three classes of women. Mature women, who did most of the labor, young single women, just learning their responsibilities, and older women, who looked after the young children. Among the collection of lodges, the political designations for men were essentially between the warrior clique and the hunting clique. Women tended to be responsible for decisions about resource allocation, trade, and interlodge social negotiations. Men were responsible for decisions which pertained to hunting, war, and spiritual health issues. Women tended to remain within a single lodge while men would typically move between lodges. They took multiple sexual partners in serially monogamous relationships. Agriculture The Pawnee women were skilled horticulturalists and cooks, cultivating and processing ten varieties of corn, seven of pumpkins and squashes, and eight of beans. They planted their crops along the fertile river bottom lands. These crops provided a wide variety of nutrients and complemented each other in making whole proteins. In addition to varieties of flint corn and flower corn for consumption, the women planted an archaic breed which they called wonderful or holy corn, specifically to be included in the sacred bundles. The holy corn was cultivated and harvested to replace corn in the sacred bundles prepared for the major seasons of winter and summer. Seeds were taken from sacred bundles for the spring planting ritual. The cycle of corn determined the annual agricultural cycle, as it was the first to be planted and first to be harvested in keeping with their cosmology. The Pawnee classified the varieties of corn by color, black, spotted, white, yellow and red. The women kept the different strains pure as they cultivated the corn. While important in agriculture, squash and beans were not given the same theological meaning as corn. Hunting after they obtained horses, the Pawnee adapted their culture and expanded their buffalo hunting seasons. With horses providing a greater range, the people traveled in both summer and winter westward to the Great Plains for buffalo hunting. They often traveled 500 miles or more in a season. In summer the march began at dawn or before, but usually did not last the entire day. Once buffalo were located, hunting did not begin until the medicine men of the tribe considered the time propitious. The hunt began by the men advancing together toward the buffalo, but no one could kill any buffalo until the warriors of the tribe gave the signal. Anyone who broke ranks was severely beaten. During the chase, the hunters guided their ponies with their knees and wielded bows and arrows. They could incapacitate buffalo with a single arrow shot into the flank between the lower ribs and the hip. The animal would soon lie down and perhaps bleed out, or the hunters would finish it off. An individual hunter might shoot as many as five buffalo in this way before backtracking and finishing them off. They preferred to kill cows and young bulls, as the taste of older bulls was disagreeable. After successful kills, the women processed the bison meat, skin and bones for various uses. The flesh was sliced into strips and dried on poles over slow fires before being stored. Prepared in this way, it was usable for several years. Although the Pawnee preferred buffalo, they also hunted other game, including elk, bear, panther, and skunk, for meat and skins. 
The skins were used for clothing and accessories, storage bags, foot coverings, fastening ropes and ties, etc. The people returned to their villages to harvest crops when the corn was ripe in late summer, or in the spring when the grass became green and they could plant a new cycle of crops. Summer hunts extended from late June to about the 1st of September, but might end early if hunting was successful. Sometimes the hunt was limited to what is now western Nebraska. Winter hunts were from late October until early April and were often to the southwest into what is now western Kansas. Religion like many other Native American tribes, the Pawnee had a cosmology with elements of all of nature represented in it. They based many rituals in the four cardinal directions. Medicine men created sacred bundles which included materials, such as an ear of corn, with great symbolic value. These were used in many religious ceremonies to maintain the balance of nature and the Pawnee relationship with the gods and spirits. The Pawnee were not part of the Sundance tradition. In the 1890s, the people participated in the ghost dance movement. The Pawnee believed that the morning star and evening star gave birth to the first Pawnee woman. The first Pawnee man was the offspring of the union of the moon and the sun. As they believed they were descendants of the stars, cosmology had a central role in daily and spiritual life. They planted their crops according to the position of the stars, which related to the appropriate time of season for planting. Like many tribal bands, they sacrificed maize and other crops to the stars. Morning Star Ritual The Skiddy Pawnee practiced human sacrifice, specifically of captive girls, in the Morning Star Ritual. They continued this practice regularly through the 1810s and possibly after 1838, the last reported sacrifice. They believed the long-standing rite ensured the fertility of the soil and success of the crops, as well as renewal of all life in spring. The sacrifice was related to the belief that the first human being was a girl, born of the mating of the morning star, the male figure of light, and evening star, a female figure of darkness, in their creation story. Typically, a warrior would dream of the morning star, usually in the autumn, which meant it was time to prepare for the various steps of the ritual. The visionary would consult with the morning star priest, who helped him prepare for his journey to find a sacrifice. With help from others, the warrior would capture a young unmarried girl from an enemy tribe. The Pawnee kept the girl and cared for her over the winter, taking her with them as they made their buffalo hunt. They arranged her sacrifice in the spring, in relation to the rising of the morning star. She was well treated and fed throughout this period. When the morning star rose ringed with red, the priest knew it was the signal for the sacrifice. He directed the men to carry out the rest of the ritual, including the construction of a scaffold outside the village. It was made of sacred woods and leathers from different animals, each of which had important symbolism. It was erected over a pit with elements corresponding to the four cardinal directions. All the elements of the ritual related to symbolic meaning and belief, and were necessary for the renewal of life. The preparations took four days. A procession of all the men and boys, even carrying male infants, accompanied the girl out of the village to the scaffold. Together they awaited the morning star. When the star was due to rise, the girl was placed and tied on the scaffold. At the moment the star appeared above the horizon, the girl was killed with an arrow, then the priest cut the skin of her chest to bleed. She was quickly shot with arrows by all the participating men and boys to hasten her death. The girl was carried to the east and placed face down so her blood would soak into the earth. With appropriate prayers for the crops and life she would bring to all life on the prairie. About 1820 to 1821, news of these sacrifices reached the East Coast. It caused a sensation among European Americans. Before this, U.S. Indian agents had counseled Pawnee chiefs to suppress the practice, as they warned of how it would upset the American settlers, who were arriving in ever greater number. Knife Chief ransomed at least two captives before sacrifice for any individual. It was extremely difficult to try to change a practice tied so closely to Pawnee belief in the annual renewal of life for the tribe.
In June 1818, the Missouri Gazette of St. Louis contained the account of a sacrifice. The last known child sacrifice was of Haxter, a 14-year-old Ogallala Lakota girl, on April 22, 1838, writing in the 1960s. The historian Jean Weltfish drew from earlier work of Whistler and Spindon to suggest that the sacrificial practice might have been transferred in the early 16th century from the Aztec of present-day Mexico. More recently, historians have disputed the proposed connection to Mesoamerican practice. They believe that the sacrifice ritual originated separately within ancient traditional Pawnee culture.